name is Michael Manella. I'm the project lead for Spring Batch, as well as I am a contributor to Spring XD. And about the past year, a little less than a year now, um, I've been spending about 50% of my time on this particular demo application. Um, here's my contact info. I'm really easy to get a hold of. If you have any questions, obviously I'll be around today. But also if you have any other questions about any of the related technologies we'll talk about today, uh, like I said, I'm easy to find. I want to sh give a quick thanks to uh, a number of people within the Pivotal organization. Uh, I work for Pivotal. Um, Pivotal sponsors Spring and a number of other open source projects. Uh, but this was definitely a cross-company effort with uh, our consulting company, Pivotal Labs, developing an iOS app for us, as well as uh, the initial cut of our dashboard, uh, our data science team in Europe uh, providing some stuff. So this is really uh, something that cross-cuts all of uh, what Pivotal does. Please ask questions when you have them. It's really painful for me to talk at you for 75 minutes, so, and I'm sure it's just as painful for you to sit and look at me for 75 minutes. So, yeah, I'd rather have this be a dialogue than just a, a lecture. So where did this all come from? If we take a step back, we had this really cool IoT project. Uh, for the record, it was not a connected car. Um, it was a connected thing. It w the same architecture that we're gonna be going over with over today was applied. Um, it was, uh, things moving, but it wasn't in the automotive industry. Uh, the problem is, is it's covered by an NDA, so I can't really talk about it. But we started thinking, we're like, is there some other way we could demo this app, this architecture and get out what we're, or how to build these types of applications in a really easy way um, that is understandable to most people? And that's where we came up with the connected car. Uh, we figured just about everybody either owns a car or has a car or been in a car or seen a car or knows what a car does. Um, all the architecture pieces that we're going to be going over today are the same as that original use case. Um, so Hadoop, uh, uh, Spring XD, all those types of things, everything on the server is exactly the same. The only difference is what's actually happening in, since this is an IoT thing, in the thing itself. So the way we're getting data off of the device is the only thing that has changed compared to what you'll see today. But before we get into the specific use case about the car, let's talk a little bit about the IoT or the Internet of Things. We hear a lot about the Internet of Things. We hear about tweeting refrigerators or toilets that, that flush when, or tweet when you flush and all kinds of crazy <laughs> consumer-based use cases. That's not what the IoT is really about. The IoT is really about operational efficiencies. It's about improving processes in a way that actually impact either our lives directly or court companies' financial bottom line. I've got a quick video I want to show you. Um, that you may, may have seen before. It's actually a commercial uh, that GE did. Um, GE is actually one of uh, Pivotal's owners. Um, this will give you an idea of the IoT. My mom, she makes underwater fans that are powered by the moon. My mom makes airplane engines that can talk. My mom makes hospitals you can hold in your hand. My mom can print amazing things right from her computer. My mom makes trains that are friends with trees. My mom works at GE. So for the record, GE is uh, uh, one of the uh, owners of Pivotal. Uh, they invested 10% uh, when we were spun off. Um, but really, when we think about those things, uh, obviously those are fanciful ren renderings of, the, of various IoT uh, scenarios, but all of those are real projects that GE are working on with, with us. Um, and they all go back to this concept, which is 1%. When we think about improving things by 1%, that can actually mean big dollars and big in, big deal uh, in industrial scenarios. The, the example I would use is cars. Right now, there are about a billion cars on the road worldwide. Assuming that China's econ economic uh, kick up maintains about the same trajectory, there will be about two billion cars on on the road by 2035. In order for to keep those running, it takes about 120 million barrels of crude oil a day. 
Assu obviously, we've had a dip down in the uh, gas, pr the crude prices recently, but assuming it's at the more uh, normal pr price of around 100 bucks a gallon or a, a barrel, um, you're looking at about $12 billion a day to keep those cars running. That's the national GDP of Albania for a year. Improving that by, and also that amount of crude oil kicks out 51.6 million uh, metric tons of CO2 into our atmosphere every year, or I'm sorry, every day. Improving that by 1% reduces the, uh, obviously the cash output by 1%, but it also reduces the carbon emissions, the equivalent of a, if Russia didn't produce a single carbon atom this, uh, or carbon dioxide molecule this year, and they are the fourth largest producer of them in the world, behind US, China, and India. So 1% becomes a very big deal when we're talking about these industrial, larger scale problems. That makes sense. So the connected car. Um, from a high level overview of how this actually lays out, obviously we have a car. Um, inside the car we have an iOS app. That provides connectivity and a couple other features that we'll get to. Um, but that's going to basically ask the car for information, get the information, pack it up, and send it to our server. Our servers will do an, a bunch of processing that will drive a dashboard that will allow us to see both real-time what the car is, where the car is at, and some real-time stats, as well as uh, some data analytics pieces that uh, we'll be getting to. Does that make sense from just a general flow? Um, it's easier to understand it when you see it in action, so let's go ahead and actually fire this up. Um, unfortunately, I'm not going to have a car driving around Atlanta today. Um, so, so, and I'll actually explain why. We actually did try it. Um, I'll explain why later on. But so instead I've got this VM. This VM is actually the exact same thing that we use when we do do this uh, demo live. Um, I'm going to start a number of processes on this uh, VM. The first, or I already have Hadoop running. Uh, Hadoop's already running in the background. That takes too long for me to sit through and to start up. Um, right now I'm starting up uh, Gemfire and Spring XD. We're using Gemfire as a, a data cache to drive the dashboard, and Spring XD is going to do the, the bulk of our data ingestion processing. So give that a second to start up. <clears throat> okay. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm actually going to deploy our two streams. I'll get into this in more detail uh, in a minute. I just wanted to uh, show you guys everything running. This is going to create two streams. Uh, one is a stream that for the actual ingestion, and one is to basically pipe off of that into Gemfire. Like, so we'll get into the details of this in just a minute. So my streams are deployed. Now I'm uh, starting up a RESTful API that we're that's actually going to power the dashboard itself. I'll fire up the dashboard itself. The REST API and the dashboard are just Spring Boot apps. Like so we'll get to all the code in a minute. That's running. And the last piece. So based on historical data, we've recorded some drives in Dallas. This is the demo will be based in Dallas. Um, so we're actually going to uh, basically replay the first drive. So this is a simulator that will emulate somebody driving around Dallas. So running. So now if we go ahead and go to our dashboard. So this is the dashboard itself. Um, we obviously have a map. On the right is uh, real-time feedback from the car. We've got speed, RPMs, uh, coolant temperature, and fuel. So how much fuel is left in the tank. So this is in almost a full tank. Um, we've got a VIN. This solution supports multiple multiple cars, and you choose which car you're looking at by VIN. Um, this is obviously where they're at currently. You can zoom in and out, drag around, all that fun stuff. Um, the more interesting tab, though, I think, is this one. So this is a blown out view of uh, the Dallas area, and it's, re it's set up 
a number of, of points. Each one of these points indicates a potential location where this dri driver is going to be going to. This application is going to, as he drives, is going to predict which one of these locations he's driving to, and then based on that journey, determine how far he can get on the current tank of gas. When you think about driving around, yeah, each one of our cars gives a little indicator of how many your range is left in your tank, right? The issue with that is it's based on your current driving pattern, not where you're going. So if you are going, if you're going to spend half your journey in the city and then half on the highway, the, to the range for that entire journey is going to be very skewed. It's going to be very wrong in the beginning. It'll be the farther you go, the more accurate it'll get. We wanted to be able to predict based on where you're going, provide a much more accurate range prediction from the start. While not a, as big of a deal in gas cars, it is a huge deal in electric cars, because obviously charging stations are a lot harder to come by than a gas station. So as you can see right now, um, the car's moving around, and just by the fact that it hung a left, basically, it's already our data science piece has already eliminated uh, spot number two, um, and then it's still bouncing around pretty evenly. It, it bounces around literally point by point between zero, one, and three. Does it use traffic patterns to predict, or is it just? Good, good question. So the question was, does, do, we, it, uh, do we incorporate other data? Is that a, a fair? So right now, we're only using the data with that from the car itself. Um, we do use historical data, so these journeys, are, journeys are, reco are recorded. This is actually being piped into HDFS as this is happening. Um, so the only, in a way, we have the impact of traffic there because of the fact that Traffic's obviously impacting your historic uh, um, drives, but no, there's no direct piece in there. We could add that, and we'll get to additional use cases later on, um, which that actually is one of them that we'll talk about. But um, just to show you, this is the file that's being written at, as the data is being streamed in on Hadoop. Does that make sense? Yeah. Into the car itself? Excellent question. Uh, hold that thought. <laughs> Any other question about the functionality before I get into how things work? Okay. Um, just make sure. Yeah, so right now it's already eliminated uh, two and three. Um, and to be perfectly honest, it's going to eliminate uh, zero pretty quick, too. Yes. Okay. So that's the example. We'll let it, we'll let it run um, while we talk. So how does this all work? Let's start in the car itself. Every car sold in the U.S. since 1990. Yeah. Sorry. So if I understood the question right, uh, you're asking, can you enter in the destination because you may take different routes to the same destination? Okay. Um, so, yeah. So in that particular scenario, it, with this app, it is VIN specific. So if you add a new journey, it's not going to predict very well. Um, if you were to, some of the use cases we're talking about, we'll be looking at it later on. Um, and companies we're working with on apps like this, they're looking to aggregate bigger chunks of data and not just use data specifically for your VIN, but aggregate your VIN and everybody else's VIN. And chances are, if you're driving to another state, you're probably going to take a path that is relatively similar to somebody else that's driven to that other state, right? If you're going from Chicago to, to Indianapolis, there's only a handful of routes that the majority of people are going to take. So by, by kind of crowdsourcing that you can get those types of predictions. Does that make sense? Well, yeah. I'm just curious if you can integrate more data, how fast it will be. Sorry, what was, sorry. 
What was it? Like if you integrate more and more information, mm -hmm. how fast the will be? So you're worried about performance, basically? We'll get to that at the end. Yeah, we'll, we'll look at this solution at scale. Good question. So, starting in the car, like I said, every car sold in the U.S. since 1996 has uh, what's called an OBD2 port, or onboard diagnostics port. Uh, if you've ever taken your car into uh, a shop and they've pulled your trouble codes or, ta or looked at your computer, the port they're plugging their, com their thing into is that port. Um, I'm actually going to pass around an example of the do one of the, a, a type of dongle you could plug into your OBD2 port to take a look at it. Um, this one's about 30 bucks on Amazon. They're cheap and easy to get. Um, that one's a Wi-Fi one. Uh, we actually use a Bluetooth one in the car. Uh, it's slightly different, um, but the concept is the same. But so OBD2 exposes a collection of data that you can basically ask the car for. So what is the RPMs? What are the speed? How much gas is left in the tank? All these types of things. Um, as well as uh, things like what is the VIN, what are what, some model specific stuff, like how big is the engine, things like that. This is an example of a request and response communication to an OBD2 uh, dongle. Um, it's, all over, it's all hex over TCP, so very low level. We're not dealing with REST, or all not kind of nice APIs here. Um, so the yellow represents the request, and the gray and orange represent the response. So the yellow in this case is, uh, like I said, there's, uh, you can request um, real-time data like uh, what is my RPM, what is my speed, and so on. And you can also ask for things like what is my VIN and things like that. Each one of those are divided up into what's called a mode. There's nine different modes in the standard. One provides most of the real-time stuff. I think it's five is the one that, re that stores like static trouble codes. So basically if your check engine light is turned on, there is a flag in mode 5 that will have been flipped. Um, mode 9 is where the static stuff is, so like your VIN and things like that. So we're asking mode 1 and then 0D, which is specifically what is my current speed. So that's the request. The response back is it's going to echo out exactly what you sent to it, so 010D. Then there's a whole bunch of metadata up to here. So this is all metadata about things like how long the message, the response is, because you can request more than one PID at a time. Um, whether or not certain cache, caching mechanisms are turned on within the, the dongle, etc. So I'm not going to get into all that detail. It really gets interesting after the four. So after, this is the meat of, of the response. One, zero D, it echoes out again what I asked for. And then the 30 is in hex, the kilometers per hour of the current speed. So in this case, 30 in hex equals 48 in, uh, kilometers per hour, which conveniently converts back to 30 miles an hour. Does that make sense? You take a look at some code. My goal of the code we're about to look at is not, well, actually before we do, let's take a look at our VMC if we've, so we've already predicted, um, we're going downtown in Dallas, so you can see with 100% certainty, um, we're going to, to that, location, and based on that, based on that journey, in other words, where we're we going, and the amount of gas we have in the tank, so we've got basically a full tank, we predict the range would be 472 miles. Does that make sense? The other piece of data we have here is the instantaneous miles per gallon. So this is, uh, it's literally calculating data point by data point, so you can get wide swings, like if you're on the highway and he takes his foot off his gas, he's burning no gas, but he's still going 60 miles an hour, so you'll see 80 miles to the gallon, and then if he's accelerating, you'll see two. So you'll see wide swings, but um, that's just one of our calculations. So let's take a quick look at the code. Um, this is what, I, what we're going to look at is actually um, an early proof of concept of this. This is, I probably freaked my neighbors out developing this. This was coded by me in my driveway with the dongle, uh, hacking away at a computer uh, late at night. So you can imagine some, some guy sitting in a car with the only light on is the, the screen in your neighborhood. That was me. Um, I'm amazed nobody called the cops. I really am. <laughs> So this is just a Spring Boot application. Um, it's designed to, to talk to that dongle pass, being passed around. 
Um, I'm using the uh, uh, Spring Integration TCP connectors to communicate with it. Um, so all I'm doing is, this is a Spring Boot application, so in my main I'm, I'm bootstrapping Spring Boot. I get this OBD2 controller class, which we'll look at in a minute. And while true, I just pull once a second for the current car's state. So if we look at the current car's state, all I'm doing is I'm looping, I'm going through and sending a request and getting a response for each one of the data points I want. So RPM, speed, fuel status, uh, engine load, the whole nine yards. Some of these have specific uh, decoding things that we have to worry about, like VIN is a very complicated bit flag thing. Um, others aren't. But all this is is gateway.send, that's the PCP gateway in Spring Integration sending this command. And the command is nothing more than what I was showing you before. So here's the speed, 010D. Does that make sense? Yeah, really, the, the, the goal of that is just to point out that it's a very low-level API. And frankly, from what I'm aware of, most of the IoT-related stuff, if you're working with actual devices, that seems to be the norm. Obviously, cars aren't connected to the internet, so we need to provide some type of connectivity. So that's why we developed a phone application. Um, so it's an iOS app that once a second asks the car for, for its information, enriches the data slightly. So the OBD2 standard doesn't provide GPS, it doesn't provide acceleration. Um, what else doesn't it provide? Uh, bearing. I think those are the main three things we're adding uh, in the iOS app. Um, so we enrich it with those pieces of information. Um, package it up in JSON so we've got something nicer to work with on, on the server. And then we just do a basic HTTP post to the server once a second. Does that make sense? This is an example of the JSON. I'm not expecting, the slides will be available so you can take a look at this in detail. But uh, this is just an example of some of the data. So longitude, distance with your uh, check engine light on, uh, coolant temp intake, uh, RPMs, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, in the back. Some uh, newer cars have So the question was, uh, since there are becoming connected cars with regards to uh, providing connectivity, uh, have we looked into removing the dongle piece of this from a hardware perspective? Yes, um, and we are talking to basically all, most of the OEMs with regards to, and other companies that provide solutions like this. Um, yeah, the, the, we'll get to, uh, there are some difficulties with doing that that we'll get to later on when we talk about the challenges of IoT. I have a follow up question. So, so your target is like not only for a newer model car, but also the old model with OBD, right? Because the majority of the car has already had it. So you, so you, without, you know, violating your non, you know, disclosure process, sounds like that's the majority of the target, right? Or you, you only work Is the question whether or not I'm only working with newer models? Well, first of all, this, this architecture is, is useful in any IoT scenario. Um, where you, like I said, the original use case that this was actually developed with wasn't even a car. Um, the actual dongle and that goes around would work theoretically with any car made since 1996. So that's the majority of the cars on the road. Um, I don't know if that answers your question or not. I had a question. Your yeah. variables, the uh, vehicle speed, um, the uh, engine load, yep. are those derivatives uh, from the iOS application that's on the actual device? Where, where are those variables? Yeah, those are hard code in our app. There's, uh, the, the, there's nothing within the standard that, uh, that has the names or anything like that. Okay, so those are hard code in? Yeah. Okay. yeah. There's that, in, in mind that, that thing that I... That, that one part of the code that was actually an enum we're using on the other side. Okay. Okay. Is the iOS app just a bridge? That's all it is. Yep. So, with regards to communication pieces specifically, um, like I said, it's a TCP socket over Bluetooth from the phone to the uh, car, and then it's HTTP posts over cellular for the um, sending the stuff to the server. The reason we had to do, uh, the reason we are actually not using the dongle being passed around is because of the fact that with iOS, you can't use Wi-Fi in cellular uh, by choice. 
So we had to go Bluetooth, and that's a Wi-Fi dongle that's being passed around. So on the server, um, every, obviously since I am a Spring developer, I'm sure you can probably figure out that everything on the server is basically Spring. Um, specifically, uh, we're going to be focusing up here, which is Spring XD. So Spring XD is our big data platform. Um, if you think about big data problems, you might have data that's in a database. You might have sensor data like in this use case. You might have uh, third-party APIs that you need to call and aggregate data. Um, in a big data solution, you typically need to aggregate that data onto a big data platform of some time. Typically Hadoop, doesn't have to be. Um, and then once you're done with that processing, you typically need to offload uh, the generated uh, output to some other type of data source that can power, whether it be a business application or, or a dashboard or something else. Spring XD is designed to handle everything essentially underneath the white circle. So ingestion, orchestration, and extraction, all with real-time analytics. Really quick, how many people have, here have used Spring XD in any capacity? Okay, good. So I'm not waste, I'm not talking to people that know what I'm talking about. Excellent. Um, so unlike Spring, most Spring projects, Spring XD is a, a distributed runtime. It's not a bunch of jar files you drop in your project. Um, so think closer to Tomcat than jar files. It supports both streaming and batch modes. Obviously, this use case is uh, streaming mainly, but there is actually a batch component that we'll talk about to this project that uh, while we're not orchestrating that with Spring XD yet, we will be. Spring XD, yeah. Can it switch between the two? So if you lose cellular service, can it batch and then recover? We haven't implemented that. This is a demo app, um, but yeah, in a real use case. So the question was, uh, can you batch up uh, missed, uh, when you don't when you have connectivity, can you batch up and then send them in, in a batch? Because it's a demo app, we haven't, but in a real uh, world use case scenario, you, yes, you would. That's exactly what you have. Spring XD has a couple different ways of interacting with it. It has an interactive shell. That's what I was using in the VM. It also has a UI. And then both of those sit on top of a set of RESTful web services that you can interact with directly if you want. This is a stream definition, specifically the stream definition for ingestion that we're using for the connected car. This is actual executable code within Spring XD. What this is saying is to use the HTTP source, pipe to a number of transformers, I'll get to each one in a minute, and then pipe that out to HDFS. So in this case, I'm doing the HTTP source, which all that does is opens up port 9000 and anything I post to it it will automatically ingest and pass on. From there, I'm passing it to a filter, which is, in this case, just a Groovy script. It's just making sure that there's, uh, there's certain data points that our da data science piece needs, specifically things like um, how much fuel, fuel is left in the tank in order to do a range prediction. So if, it, for, if for some reason that packet comes along and it doesn't have it, we're just dropping it. Um, we get a packet a second per car, so if we lose, if one or two doesn't have it, it's not the end of the world. From there, we have an enrichment uh, transformer that is really just uh, uppercasing the VIN and doing some data cleanup after it's been filtered. The interesting transformer we have is actually the shell. So this is actually executing a Python process that was developed by our data science team. That's where the data science magic occurs with regards to predicting where the journey is going to be and the range prediction. Does that make sense? Yeah, so the, the shell is actually executing a external Python process. That's exactly what I mean. Yep. Exactly. Yes, yes, exactly. Um, it actually it just uses standard in and standard out to communicate with it. So, yeah, anything you can execute from a command line, you can execute from our shell transformer. That's not looking at just the incoming packet, right? It's looking at historical data, too. It is stateful, yes. Okay. Um, so is it looking at the, the Hadoop data already in there? No. So, it, so the question was, does it look at the Hadoop data in there? Uh, no. So it maintains um, some state within the process, as well as... Um, it loads a model of historical data that was generated in, a, in an offline batch piece. Um, we'll get into the details of that, this particular part a little later. Um, but yeah, there's basically a batch piece that trains a model. 
it loads that on startup, and then based on that model, it does the predictions that way. Yeah. Is that a pretty typical um, pattern that you see in the Internet of Things, as opposed to just HTTP streaming right into HTF HDFS and then tapping that to do your enrichment and analytics? Um, depends on your use case. Uh, yeah, but actually, the technically the right way to do a data lake, if you will, would be to pull these out, pipe to HDFS, and pipe basically, or tap basically here, and then do all the enrichment. Um, because you want the raw data going into HDFS, and then anything else you want going somewhere else. So is this like a, this spring, this is like a, a small size uh, OS, like Linux based type of thing? Or? We, so the um, definitions are based on Linux pipes and filters. So in fact, I can bring up these, the, the actual shell definition or the actual stream definition um, in the VM. Actually, not computer here. So this is the actual shell command, that script that I ran in the VM, that this is it. So a stream create, the name, so the name of the stream I'm creating, the definition, so in quotes is basically what was on the slide. But so HTTP pipe filter, and then I've got the dash dash arguments like you would in, on a Linux shell, a Linux command line. And it's designed to be that way. Yeah. So in this case, that's the path to the script for the filter. Um, whoops. And then Acme Enrich, which doesn't have any. The shell itself, uh, input type. I'm actually converting the, the stuff to JSON here. Um, and then the command is literally, if I, Whatever you would have typed in at a bash shell, copy that, paste that here. So in this case, we're using, whoops. So Python stream predict.py. And then also the directory that you would have executed it from. Does that make sense? Oh. No. Yeah. How, what if you have a problem with one of these pipes? Uh, how do you debug that? What, uh, Problem with one of the pipes, meaning? Yeah, something fails, filters, incorrect, if your enrichment's wrong, your shell command, problem. Uh, like you would most other, so each one, that's actually a real good question. Um, each one of these, while they're connected by the, the pipes, each one of these is nothing more than a spring application context. So the HTTP, the, let me show you that really quick. I um, wasn't planning on getting that deep, but okay. Let's, see. Let's do this instead. So within Spring XD, there's a number of different types of modules. There's jobs, sources, syncs, and processors. Jobs are obviously the batch piece of this. And then syncs, sources, and processes are for streams. Um, so if we take a look at this, uh, the HTTP source, you've got a number of different ones that, we, that come out of the box. Um, we're using the HTTP one. So if we go into the HTTP, oops. You'll see there's a config directory and a lib directory. Lib has all the classes. Uh, config is the interesting piece here. So if we go to config. So if you're familiar with Spring, this should look really familiar. Something more than an application context. This is the configuration for the HTTP source. All it is, is we're using the netty uh, HTTP inbound uh, adapter that is available with uh, Spring integration. A source within Spring within Spring XD is something that writes to a channel called output. A processor is something that reads from a channel called input, does something, and writes to a channel called output. A sync is something that reads from a channel called input and does something. 
That's the only contract that any of these have. And everything else is regular spring stuff. Does that make sense? We'll get into the code of our specific, the, the pieces that we wrote, because the Acme Transformer is, is actually a custom module. Um, we'll get to that one in just a minute. So this is the ingestion stream we're using. We are tapping the stream. So tapping is essentially a wiretap. It takes a copy of the data at whatever point we tap it at and sends it in both directions, both the initial, initial line and our, this new line. We're tapping after the shell, and we're sending that through a transformer that's going to convert the type. Going before that type conversion, it's a string that is in the format of a JSON. Afterwards, we're converting it to a POJO. That POJO will be stored in Gemfire, which is what we use to power our dashboard. The reason we're doing the conversion is it allows us to use Spring Data REST for our API. Um, so all I need to do is create a repository, point that to Gemfire, and everything just works from the API perspective. That's pretty much everything on the server from a component perspective. From a deployment perspective, within Spring XD, we have all of this. So we've got HTTP, the transformers, Python, and HDFS, which is writing out to HDFS. The tap occurs right there with the transformers, and that writes to Gemfire, which powers our dashboard. So from a deployment perspective, this is what it would look like. Does that make sense? The cool thing is, the only things that we had to write code for are the things in green. So we wrote our custom dashboard. The transformers, you'll see how simple that is. And then the Python, which is really the business logic of this. It's the data science piece. Everything else is out of the box. Let's take a look at our custom transformers. One question? Yeah. So on that, I was surprised to see like nothing from HDFS. It looks like it gets into the Gemfire or the dashboard view. But... There's a sep there's a offline piece to that, which I'll talk about during the data science piece. So we have this enrichment transformer, which you'll find incredibly complicated. We, all it is is we're implementing transformer, which is just a spring integration transformer interface with a single method transform. It takes a message and sends a message. We get the payload out of the uh, message. We deserial, we uh, convert it into a map. We add the current timestamp, a GUID, and we uppercase the VIN. Package it back up and send it on its way. That's all the code for that trans for the Acme Energy Transformer. Um, the only other piece is the configuration, which is nothing more than channel input, like I mentioned. My transformer, which is just a spring integration transformer namespace thing. So input channel input, output channel output class that I'm using, which is the class we just looked at, and then the channel's output. That's it for that transformer. And that's really all it requires for any type of transformer. Just how complicated the processing is within that transformer. The other piece that we've got is the filter. That is nothing more than a Groovy script. So in this case, I create a JSON slurper, if you're familiar with Groovy. Um, surf, slurper that part, parse text payload is basically going to take the JSON payload and convert it into an object I can work with. I'm going to get a number of fields that we care about, so fuel level input, mass airflow, RPMs, and such. Um, I'll, by default, return it, and then I check to see if all the values that I need are there. If they're there, I let it go. If not, I say don't, and it, you'll get dropped. That makes sense. Again, that's all the custom code uh, within Spring XD that we had to write to make this work. While we're in here, I'll also sh show you the actually yeah. Let me show you the Gemfire transformer as well. So the type conversion transformer again, really complicated. Um, so I again, it's a transformer, so the layout's the same, but we get the message. I convert it to a map. This car position POJO has a map constructor that'll do the mapping for me. 
and then I package it back up. This time I package up the car position object as opposed to a map. This car position object is nothing more than a POJO representation of the JSON that we looked at earlier. Does that make sense? This is the GPS? It's got GPS, it's got all the, the OBD2 data. It's the location, the position of uh, the launch and the latitude. That's what this position is? Car position? Yes, yes. Does that make sense? Questions on what's happening within Spring XD? Cool. Yeah. Do the filters have to be written in Groovy? Nope. So the question was, do the filters have to be written in Groovy? No, they don't. Um, you can use spell. You can actually write a filter if you want using Java code. Um, Groovy is just quick and dirty and easy. So. Cool. Yeah. <clears throat> you have all these pipes and nothing, if the filter filters everything out, it just is gone, right? It's consumed. So it only, is it only taking valuable data? I mean, In this case, yeah, if, it, it only has to be, if we don't get data that we can use, we don't let it pass. Um, you could uh, do things like tapping and getting, you know, having like error cues, which for stuff that, if we actually wanted to track that type of thing, you can definitely do all that. Because of this use case, we just aren't right now. It's just your responsibility to build all that in. That's not part of the... The ability to, to do like the error cues and that's built in. Um, yeah, you can do all that stuff too. So the data science piece. This is what's happening in that shell transformer. Um, it's, data science piece is responsible for two things. Number one, predicting the journey. So where are you going? And then based on that and the amount of gas left in the tank, it's going to predict your range. It does that with a couple things. Uh, first of all, it stores all the, the data coming in from the sensors. So that's what the HDF, storing the stuff in HDFS is doing. Af, af, periodically, we do an offline batch training. That's going to generate a model that will be evalu evaluated in the real time stream predict. So whoever asked the question about is the, yeah, is the Hadoop stuff feeding back in, this is how that gets fed back in. So the batch training uses Spark to read the HDFS data and does its batch training and generates a model, basically clustering the potential journeys and determining endpoints that way. On the prediction side, it starts off with an initial prediction. So if I'm parked in my driveway at 8 a.m. on Monday morning, there's a good chance I'm going to work, right? We can figure that out based on location and time. If it's 5 p.m. Friday and my car's at, in, at work, sparking a lot, I give it 50-50 whether or not I'm going home or the bar. So that type of prediction based on time and, loca and location is where we start off with. As you drive, we fade that out into a real-time prediction. So it's a weighted average that basically we wait uh, 100 percent to the initial one initially, and then I think it's uh, 90 data points, so a minute and a half we fade on out to full uh, um, full to the real-time prediction. This is an example of the JSON that's added by the data science piece. So we get uh, a cluster of predictions or an array of predictions. Each one has a potential end location GPS coordinate. The miles per gallon expected for the journey, so we can then calculate your range based on how much gas is in the tank, and then the probability that that uh, particular endpoint is where you're going. So on that dashboard, that's the probability is what's driving the probability on the dashboard. Does that make sense? The dashboard obviously is running with real time. It's uh, uh, using a collection of technologies. Gemfire is our data store. We, we chose Gemfire specifically because it handles concurrent updates really well. Um, and if you have a lot of different cars, each one of our cars in this case has uh, one data point per VIN. So each VIN has its own, basically the last data point. So if you need to be updating a lot of them concurrently, if you're running, let's say, hundreds of thousands or millions of cars, Gemfire handles this type of thing really well. Um, REST is feeding the API to, to the dashboard. Uh, it's the HTML piece is based on Yaomin. If you've done any uh, HTML5 Angular type stuff, you might have heard of that. And it is an Angular app. Um, let me take a quick look at the 
at least the REST API. I don't want to bore you guys with the JavaScript pieces of it. Um, but the nice thing about the REST API is, again, it's a boost, boot app using uh, Spring Data REST. So all I need to do is configure where my Gemfire repositories are, which are in this package. Enable component scanning for uh, another package for a cores filter. Configure Gemfire. And then I just have this application, Spring Boot application. Spring Data REST then takes my repositories, which are in here. So I've got a car position repository, which is just an empty interface with that extends CRUD repository. And a journeys repository, which gives us a list of the data points, the zero through four on the map. This gives us that. Um, but that's all the code for the REST API. That and the POJOs. Everything else is, is provided for us by Spring Data REST. And it's actually kind of nice. You even get, um, with the Spring Data REST stuff, you get full hell support the whole nine yards. So we get, um, if I were to actually hit one of these, So you get the full links to your appropriate locations and so on. So uh, like journeys, so if I copied that. So, so here's a list of all the journeys that replies back. So as an ex just as an example, but you can see with no code, I get this nice API. On the dashboard, you can see we've arrived at our location. That's where we ended up. Um, so it predicted correctly. And then that's the predicted range. So somebody asked about uh, with regards to speed and what does this look like at scale. Um, this the solution was originally designed to support hundreds of thousands of clients, so hundreds of thousands of, of things in there, um, receiving millions of messages uh, with an ingestion rate of over 100 gig per minute. Um, so what does that look like at scale? By def yeah. About the number of vehicles, I'm not sure if you're going to monetize this or try to sell it. Uh, if you thought about security, what would you do about all the data flies through the air and you're picking off the... I'll get to that in a minute. The question was what about security? We'll get to that. So obviously the Spring XD is a distributed runtime. So essentially each one of those modules can be deployed either co-located all in one container or you can have them out all in separate containers if you want. In fact, that's the default behavior with Spring XD. It, actually, if you have, let's say, 10 containers, it'll round robin the deployment of modules. So one, module, one container would get HTTP, another one would get the filter, another one would get the transformer, and so on. Um, which ends up looking like this. So I'd have HTTP, it would actually have to do a rabbit hop to the transformers. Each one of the transformers would do a rabbit hop, to, then out to HTFS, which writes to the sink. Um, same thing with the tap, it would uh, run out, out to the transformers, back to RabbitMQ, and back to Gemfire. Whoops. What can you guys see wrong with that solution if you need to get a lot of data through it? Yeah, bottleneck and rabbit. There's a lot of hops going on, aren't there? So how do we make it faster? There's two ways. Number one, shrink the payload, just like anything. Um, so the original data at the NDA client wasn't being sent zipped in any format, and it was also just a massive uh, amount of data to be sending as frequently as they had. It was over 10K per, per message. Um, so we were able to narrow that down as well as compress it. Um, the other thing is, in this particular one, we're obviously I.O. bound. Uh, you got all that red is all places where, when you think about it, you really don't need to be making hops. Um, this is an extreme version. We didn't go quite this far. The, the taps, or basically this tapped is external, so there is Rabbit in there. Um, but basically, you can co-locate modules. So that eliminates that Rabbit hop. Mike, does Spring XD automatically launch Rabbit, or do we have to fiddle with it? Uh... So the question was, does XD basically manage Rabbit? Um, it does not, you do have to, in a clustered environment, you have to manage it. Um, 
for high availability, um, XD provides clustering. So you'd want to cluster your Zookeeper uh, instance, which maintains essentially the, the state of the cluster. So what containers are available, what nodes, are, what modules are deployed on what containers, all the, those types of things. And it also is used in part to be able to uh, handle failover. So if a uh, container goes down, uh, it'll redeploy the modules and those types of things. So you definitely want a, a cluster for Zookeeper. And then you can also cluster the containers. And actually, you can even partition. In this case, you'd want to partition them. So when we say partitioning, what does that mean? In this case, we would have it set up so that uh, each VIN was going to a particular instance. Basically, we'd have sticky VINs. Um, that would allow you to, that because the shell processor is stateful, we need to make sure that the, that particular VIN is going to the same instance of the Python stuff. Um, but beyond that, we could cluster everything else as, as far as we wanted. Does that make sense? Obviously, HGFS is clustered, and so is Gemfire. IoT-related issues. So there have been a couple questions that have come up with regards to kind of poking holes into to this. And there are issues with the IoT space in general. Um, the first one is compatibility. The reason we're not, I don't have a car driving around in, in Atlanta today is because of compatibility. The OBD2 standard, as an example, provides a list of where to look for data. So it tells me what to ask for if I want RPM. It tells me what to ask for if I want uh, how much gas is left in your tank. The caveat is, is it's up to the automotive manufacturers whether or not they're going to provide all of that data. And the cars I had access to, the amount of fuel left in the tank wasn't one of the data points that they were giving us. So I can't do a range prediction if I don't know how much gas you have. Um, also with that, even within the OBD2 standard, there's also the ability to extend beyond just the standard amount of PIDs. That is actually a proprietary extension based on each OEM. OEMs license that information for as much as 50 grand a year. So it's not some, it's not some open source free thing that anybody can grab and start developing with. A lot of these companies that you see that are doing this type of stuff are literally reverse engineering this stuff because of how cost prohibitive it is to get into the space. And unfortunately, a lot of the uh, APIs that you see for devices are like that. They are either very proprietary or not. they don't transfer well from car to car to car or device to device device. So let's say I wrote, using Nest as an example, let's say I wanted to write an API or an application that, that fed off of smart thermostats. If I, wrote one, if I wrote an adapter for Nest, it very well may not work for a Honeywell one or another one. So there's lots of adapters and lots of incompatibility, even within a, the same device space, that you have to deal with. Connectivity is another thing. Um, obviously, most of the Internet of Things that you want to connect aren't connected to the Internet. Most thermostats aren't connected. Most refrigerators aren't connected. Most trains aren't connected, etc. So you, it's not uncommon to have to add that connectivity. We did it with a, with a, a phone app, obviously. Uh, but it's not uncommon to have to add either a cell chip or a Wi-Fi chip in a device. Um, in fact, uh, who here has seen the progressive dongle that they'll give you for insurance discounts or a related one, whether it be progressive or not? Those have a cell chip in them. So that's how they're communicating back. Um, in fact, there's actually a, I shouldn't say this, but there's a video on YouTube of how to hook up a 9-volt battery to it so you can get the discount without, regardless of how you drive. Heard not here. <laughs> security is the other big one. Um, most of these devices flat out aren't designed for security. It was, it's an afterthought. It's an add-on. Um, the OBD2 is a great example of that. There is no security in that thing at all. You can read right off the CAN bus with no authentication, no authorization. Um, most of the dongles are read-only in this specific space. But uh, yeah, actually, there was um, I was at OSCON last year presenting and they were talking about the security of the Internet of Things, and the example they used was you could actually, kill, in theory, you could kill somebody by hacking into their smart refrigerator and shutting it off for, while they sleep, slowly spoiling their food, and they would have no idea. Um, but to that point, security and also privacy are obviously big concerns. The, the data going over the wire and also what you're doing with it. Because um, uh, with regards to the privacy thing, uh, does anybody here know who owns Nest? Google. 
Why would a search engine company buy a thermostat company? Exactly. The great way to know when you're home. So there's obviously, you know, with great, with great, uh, um, with great power comes great responsibility. That that plays directly into this space. It's people are trusting us with our with their data. We need to be responsible with it. Looking to the future a bit. So where are we taking this solution? Um, this is actually V2 of it. V1 wasn't using HDFS. It wasn't using Spark. Um, so we've added all that stuff over the past year. Uh, the next steps are to get this on our on our PaaS Cloud Cloud Foundry. Um, so to to simplify the management of Spring XD. Um, and also we want to update the batch training to be orchestrated via Spring XD. Right now it's an off, it's completely offline, it's a manual process, but we'd like to actually have Spring, Spring XD run a Spring Batch job that kicks that off, say, hourly and updates it automatically. Some additional use cases. So what could you do with this? Obviously the use case we put, picked to do this is pretty simplistic, right? Um, what are some additional things you could do with this? Uh, driving efficiency is one that actually some startups are already working in. Um, I, I'm drawing a blank on the name of the company, but there's one company that uh, you get a dongle in an iOS app, and basically it'll vibrate the phone when you're accelerating too hard, you're braking too hard, those types of things. You could easily, pardon? Thank you. Yes, Automatic is the name of the company. Um, it, implementing something like that with this would be virtually a no-brainer. It's adding the vibration feedback. It's really all you'd have to do. Traffic patterns is another thing. So if you want to develop something like a Waze, uh, application, if you're familiar with that, basically crowdsourcing traffic information. Again, we'd have all the data pertinent here for you. It also be you'd also be able to do better routing based on those traffic patterns. So if if we were getting you know multiple drivers data, I could see you know you and you are both going to the same neck of the woods. You guys both start in the same neck of the woods. You take a different route than you, and you seem to get there about 15 minutes quicker than you do. So I could start routing you actually giving you better routes based on that crowdsourced data. Gas pricing is actually one of the original use cases we looked at. So with the field engineer that was behind the idea of this, uh, he lives in Chicago, so he does a lot of city driving during the week. And then he has a home in Michigan, which has significantly cheaper gas prices. So he was curious about, could he get to the cheaper gas prices if he was at the end of his tank? Does that make sense? Can he, can he do that? The problem is the range predictions with the car, within current cars, are too unpredictable. He can't rely enough on that to get every last drop of gas out of that tank. Um, so we considered basically, you know, could we do something better? Specifically, if we could predict the journey going from Chicago to his, to his other home, we know that, yeah, the first 45 minutes of his drive is going to be city driving and it's going to get poor gas mileage, but we also know that the second half of that drive is all highway driving and his gas mileage is going to shoot up. So if we can predict that from basically when he's pulling out of his driveway, he knows whether or not he needs to fill up in Chicago or if he can wait. Last one is accident assistance. And I've got another video for this. No, 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 it's just, it's just construction, yeah, that's all. No, 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 I'm, I, I'm not driving. Are you okay? Yeah, you? I'm good, I'm good. Go oh, no, not you. Listen, I'm gonna have to call my agent. Mr. I'm gonna Burton? get right back to you. Mr. Burton, this is InsureCorp. We've received sensor data that indicates you were in an accident. Are you injured in any way? I'm not injured, no. Is anyone else injured? I don't believe so. Okay, where's my agent's number? We have pinpointed your location and we are showing your car is not drivable. So we are dispatching an Uber car to take you to your destination. That would be great. I'm pressing one. English. E-N-G-L-I, English. May we give your coordinates to our appraiser drone to perform the appraisal? Absolutely. <laughs> We have received the photos, assessed the damage, authorized the repair, selected a qualified repair facility, and have dispatched a tow truck to take your vehicle to that facility. Perfect. Yes, hi, this is... Yes. 
I'll hold. We have looked up the other vehicle's insurance, transmitted the appropriate data to create the claim, and filed the California SR1 accident report. Can you confirm the information is correct on your phone, then hit the accept button? Uh, I'll check it right now. Okay, all done. Thank you. Your Uber car is arriving now. Ah, I see it coming. Accident, not payment, accident. Your tow truck should be there now. Don't forget to leave your keys in the vehicle. Thank you for using InsureCorp, powered by Pivotal Labs. So that video was uh, presented at, uh, I think it was VMworld a year and a half ago, two years ago now. Um, while we're all laughing about it, we're actually talking to insurance companies and implementing literally that. Every piece of it. So the idea that this is, is far-fetched and funny, we can actually make it happen today. Um, one caveat, the drone thing, we're not going to have drones flying over highways. Um, they are looking at drones for other things, but uh, that, I digress. Um, <laughs> no, <laughs> no. So obviously the IoT is everywhere. Uh, the devices that we want to connect to the internet and do smart things with are literally everywhere. Um, and GE has partnered with the World Bank and put together this big picture, but basically it's illustrating the uh, economic impact the IoT, IoT will have over the next few years. Um, they've broken it down specifically into advanced economies and developing economies, but these numbers are all in the trillions. So manufacturing, 6.1 trillion. Transportation, 2.6 trillion. Healthcare, uh, was it, 5.3 trillion. The no, the, going back to that 1%, improving these things by 1% can have an immense impact. And the Internet of Things is, is what's going to drive a large piece of that. So IoT obviously presents a, a unique set of challenges. This isn't building a website. Um, so there's a lot of different uh, hurdles that you need to be able to cross. But if you can bridge those gaps, if you can get the connectivity, if you can address things like security and privacy, if you can uh, deal with the, the device compatibilities and whatnot, um, at least on the server sites, we like to think Spring XD does a pretty good job of making life easier on the server side. And with that, talk okay. at questions. Oh, thanks, everybody.